this is which class they are? Tenth class in this then? Almost tenth? And uh, how many students are there now in each year? You are part of who can just sit. You can keep sitting. You can just tell us you are from? I'm from Apollo, sir. Apollo. Uh, final year. Uh, how, how many are final year students? Okay, a lot of final year students. Third, second year? <laughs> and first year, hardly anyone? First year, anyone. Uh, they are not able to come, possibly. Right. And what is the usual attendance there? 25, 25, 20, 25 people. 25 people. All right. Anything you find is lacking? Uh, you want any improvement? All of you. Because this we started uh, around two and a half months, restarted. So this possibly you did not attend the initial sessions when they were held in Fortis or something, you were not there. Because of the COVID, we remained quiet for almost three years. So any suggestion or anything you want should be incorporated, you can tell us. Right? Yeah, 6 30, we can go ahead and start. Uh, I am presenting the case of Mrs. Amar, a 53 year old senior Hindu by religion resident of Allahabad. Slow, let them absorb. You can close the door. 53 year old female. 53 year old female Hindu by religion resident of Allahabad uh, who has uh, studied up to class 10. She is unmarried and currently unemployed. History is given by the patient and her brother and is reliable. Uh, she presented with the complaints of rash all over her bo uh, body one month ago. Swelling over both lower limbs since three weeks and decreased urine output since two weeks. I would like to date my history from 14 years ago when she first noticed symptoms related to, to the presenting issue. In 14 years ago? Yes. Okay. So uh, that means the symptomatology started at the age of 39. 38. Okay. Uh, in 2008, when she was around 38 years of age, she noticed that she developed swelling of both lower limbs. Uh, this she noticed when she uh, developed tightness of uh, her usual footwear and she also noticed track marks over her, of her slippers over her feet. This swelling was insidious in onset and gradually progressive and over the next one month it worsened to involve both upper limbs also. During this time she also noticed that she has a swelling around her eyes. This swelling of lower limbs uh, aggravated on prolonged standing and was partially relieved on lying down. She denies any history of abdominal distension, shortness of breath, or decreased urine output during this episode. During the same time, she also gives history of oral ulcers, which involved the buccal mucosa and the palate. This uh, she noticed when she developed burning sensation while eating food, and these ulcers were usually transient. She denies any history of rash over the rest of her body. She also gives history of menorrhagia during this time. Uh, on further probing, she does not give any history of joint pains or alopecia during that time, no history of reduced uh, urine output or no history of any blood and urine. For these above complaints, she consulted a local hospital. Uh, she was told to have low hemoglobin after uh, and low protein after doing a few initial blood tests. She was treated with oral medications, the details of which she does not remember. She took these medications for around one month and however her symptoms persisted. Due to these persistent symptoms, she visited another physician and underwent further battery of tests which included both blood and urine tests. After these tests, she was told that she has a kidney problem due to which there is, a, there is protein in her urine, but she was also told that her creatinine was normal. For these complaints, she was referred to a nephrologist in Allahabad. By, uh, on further they said there is a protein in the urine, that is the time. I think third year we can start with. How do you test protein in the urine? You can keep sitting also if you want. Sir, either it is qualitative or it, it can be quantitative. In, uh, we don't know about the case at the moment. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, how do you test? Sir, urine dipstick. We see for albumin in urine dipstick. <coughs> or we can measure it in 24 hours urinary protein, which is quantitative or albumin. What is the reagent for testing protein? Yes, 
for third year in a normal dipstick urine test, how many things can be tested in that? How many? A normal standard dipstick has got how many pads? Ten pads. So one of them is for protein. Yeah. First year, anybody, any first year student? No. Second year? Second year can stand up. You can just count the ten. One person who is answering. You can just tell us which are the ten tests on that urine dipstick pad. She said one protein. What else? pH. All right. Glucose, ketones, blood. Now, please, please sit down. Bilirubin, urobilinogen. Now, what is the chemical for protein? That was your question. Very good. It is tetrabromphenol, but that is only testing albumin. It is not testing other proteins. All right, it is specific for that. Now you said quantitative, I want to test quantitatively. quantitatively. One test she said, I can do it simply by urine dipstick. That is how you are testing in the exam. Other methods. All right, let's method. You have to tell us the method, how do you test? If you are told in the exam to test it, you have to test, Baba. So what is... How will you collect it? Heat coagulation. Heat coagulation. Drawback. Anybody, anybody can tell. How do you test heat coagulation? Are you are the student today. In a test tube, we take... Whatever you have taken urine, what do you do then? So, uh, the uh, top part of it, we uh, have to uh, heat against the muscle okay. and there is a coagulum which is formed. Then, it's semi quantitative. Uh, what do you do after the coagulation? Coagulum is formed, what do you do? What What do you add to that? You have to add acetic acid. Why? This coagulum may be due to phosphate. So you have to dissolve them if it is that. And then if it persists, then you say that is a crude test you can do anywhere. Just take a urine in the dipstick, slant it, upper portion heat it. If there is a coagulum, add acetic acid. It is still there. You say, Baba, protein is there. Second, you said if it is available, you can take a dipstick. And she said it is tetra bromophenol. Our bromophenol is the chemical we are testing. And what is the sulfosalicylic acid test? Sulfosalicylic acid. Well, you are supposed to know in the exam, Baba. Anybody? You will not be left, you will not be pardoned in the exam if you don't know the basics of urine examination. So you have to take equal amount of urine and 3% or 5% sulfosalicylic acid. Just mix them. There will be a coagulum form. So that you are grading from 0 to 4. So depending on, these are all semi-quantitative. If you are asked quantitative, again now you will get stuck. How do you measure that? Alright, we will come to that. So semi-quantitative, you should know three methods. Go ahead. So she was told she has got protein in the urine. Okay. For this, uh, she was uh, referred to an uh, on uh, consultation with the nephrologist, she was investigated further. What will be your impression? Uh, 
she has presented with swelling of lower limbs. She said it spread over it involved upper limbs also, you said it became facial swelling also, that was one. Second, you said she had, uh, she was told to have low hemoglobin and protein. What is your impression? Uh, so she has uh, probably a necrotic syndrome. Could be. Uh, Could be any patient presenting with the... Uh, other organ. causes of fetal edema and need to be ruled out at this point, like uh, CRD, uh, The definition of nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is nephrotic range proteinuria along with uh, hypoalbuminemia or edema. And edema. Yes. Anybody? Mention the, what is nephrotic range protein? So more than 3.5 grams of protein uh, in 24 hours. Per 1.73 square meter body surface area. In presence of normal kidney functions. If a person is having uh, CKD, creatinine is 4, then this definition is not applicable. The <coughs> nephrotic proteinuria in presence of normal kidney functions is hypoalbuminemia a necessary component? Is hypoalbuminemia or edema? Edema, alright. Third year. Why the edema develops? She says there is a hypoproteinemia. Why does edema develop? Sir, uh, there can be underfill theory or the overfill theory. So, in case uh, uh, one, one says that uh, due to there is uh, albumin loss, uh, there is decrease on cortic pressure and uh, uh, interstitial on cortic pressure is there. So, the fluid. How much is the normal on cortic pressure for you? Yeah. What is the normal oncotic pressure in your body? 25, some 20 to 25 Very good. Sit down. 25 millimeter of mercury. That is due to proteins. Right? So that is the normal oncotic pressure. He says because the albumin is low. Mind you, the definition of nephrotic proteinuria does not necessarily mean hypoalbuminemia. Nephrotic range proteinuria, yes. Plus lipid urea. <coughs> definition, I don't know if the definition has changed. Our time there were two components. Nephrotic range protein urea plus lipid urea. Plus in addition you can have hypoalbuminemia. You can have, because if a person is very healthy, very well fed person. In the initial stages, he may be having nephrotic protein urea. He may not develop hypoalbuminemia. So you cannot say that he does not fulfill the definition of nephrotic syndrome. So fine, so because of you said low oncotic pressure that is one theory that the interstitial pressure is more and oncotic is low so the flu leaks out. So that is one. The second theory is? Second theory is sir, uh, due to low intravascular volume there is uh, sodium and water reabsorption. Uh, okay, go ahead. She was further by Some examiners can ask you also grades of edema. You would like to say, tell us. You should go and read Oxford textbook of medicine. Reference is that they have put edema into 6 plus. Like above up to ankle 1 plus, above ankle below knee 2 plus, up to knee 3 plus. Above knee 4 plus, abdominal 5 plus, pleural effusion 6 plus. This is Oxford textbook of medicine. Some examiners in exam are particular. How do you grade? Like this lady, you said there is no abdominal. You said, you made a mention there is no abdominal distension. So you are trying to say edema is possibly up to grade 3 or 4. Okay? So that was she presented with edema, she presented with oral ulcers and protein urea. No, hypoalbuminemia. Go ahead. Uh, she was investigated further by this nephrologist and she underwent a renal biopsy, after which she was told to have a condition called SLE. Uh, 
she was uh, also started on medications after this, which when you mentioned kidney biopsies, mentioned there was no immediately used by her. Uneventful kidney biopsies. Yes, you have to mention because the way it means you know the case in the exam you will not know the case. She was started on oral medications for the same. You which said uh, she was told she has got SLE on biopsy. While there, what features on biopsy make you suspicious of SLE? Presence of bullous or higher fluid in the You can stand if you want. Presence of full house pattern on higher. That is one. What is full house? Presence of the IG, IgG, IgG, uh, A and C3, C1, Q, Alpha and I. Okay. So one is if there is a full house. Yes. Any other condition where you can have similar picture? You are not finished. This is one suggestion you are giving. What are the other suggestions? Hematoxin in bodies. So one is you find the different type of lesions. It is not a typical one type. All the segments of the kidney may be involved. Normally you say either there is an endothelial involvement or proliferation there or infiltration <coughs> there like you have got acute nephritic syndrome. So possibly endothelial infiltration, endothelial hypertrophy is there. There can be conditions where membrane is involved, other conditions maybe the subepithelium is involved. But if you find all different areas are getting involved, diff different, so that makes you think and in different stages some lesion is beginning, some lesion has become crescent, some lesion is fibrosis. So then you start thinking that it is a variation, heterogeneity of lesions in the kidney. That makes you think one. Second, as you said, that possibly if you have got a full house, you start thinking it could be that. <coughs> now if I do electron microscopy, which other lesions will suggest That you said there can be different areas of involvement and tubular reticular structures, TRS, which can be found in HIV also. But if you the TRS is also there, so then possibly you think that maybe we are dealing with SLE. So she was told that she has got SLE. Right? Okay. Alley body. Body, alley body. What is that? What is that? Due to immune complex deposition, there is red stains. What does it contain? It's a degenerated nuclear material plus autoantibody plus immune complex plus little bit cycle. So, old examiner will definitely ask you what is LE cell or LE body. Okay. Uh, she was started on medications which she remembers to be uh, MMS 360MG, which we, she was take, uh, told to take twice daily, and steroids. Which she was started on MMS. MMS. And steroids. And steroids. Okay. This is 14 years back. Okay. And uh, she was continued on these uh, same medications for the next two to three years. The next two to three years, according to her, were uneventful, with no intervening in, uh, uh, infections in the uh, or uh, uh, GI intolerance. Uh, she was compliant to these medications and was regularly following up with her nephrologist. On follow-up, she was also told that there is no further uh, protein in urine, and her edema had resolved over the next two to three years. Over next two to three? Yes, she was continued on the same medication. Three years later, however, she started developing swelling of feet again, 
while on these medications <coughs> and she was investigated again with blood and urine tests. No, you have to be clear. You, she was started on MMF and prednisone. That was the initial, initial treatment that she was starting on. Okay. Okay. You approve of this treatment? Induction therapy with this. Mind you, she is an unmarried lady. She is a? Unmarried. Unmarried. She is still unmarried. She she's has been stuck. Okay. We could have given cyclophosphamide. If, uh, but at that point, she had only proteinuria and normal renal functions. So, induction treatment can have steroid and MMF. Both the other induction treatment of steroid plus cyclophosphamide could have also been given. But uh, at the presentation. Okay, you go ahead. We will discuss later. Uh, around three years later, however, she started developing swelling of feet again while on these medications and she was investigated again. She was told to have reappearance of protein in urine, the exact quantification of which she does not remember. However, at this time she was told that her medications need to be changed and she was started off. She was continued on steroids, however, her MMF was stopped and she was started on tacrolimus. Uh, she was continued on tacrolimus for the next two years, but she continued to have swelling on and off while on this medication. Because of these persistent symptoms, she became non-compliant to treatment, and then she stopped taking treatment. On, uh, she stopped taking tacrolimus. However, she used to take uh, uh, steroids on and off. So she had been non-compliant to the treatment after two years of taking tacrolimus. She was taking only steroids. So I, I'll keep recapitulating what you said. She was started on MMF and prednisolone. She was continuing it for three years. While on medication, she develops a relapse. I'm not sure whether you are aware whether she had stopped medication, whether the dose was very minimal, but whatever, she had relapse. So then, they thought that we should change that medication and she was switched on tacrolimus. Tacrolimus she took for two years and not, after that... Not regularly again because she kept on having symptoms so she uh, was not compliant symptoms? and she what? developed swelling of feet again and again. So she was not compliant to her medication. She continued her steroids but did not take uh, tacrolimus in a compliant manner and then she stopped her tacrolimus altogether after two years by herself. Okay. And after, now she presented to us with history of one month of uh, one one month back she developed rash which in between she was not any follow -up. she was not on any follow up in but she continued to have uh, only steroid only no steroid on and off and no follow up and continued to feel lady more one month ago she developed rash which involved both upper limbs trunk and face it was insidious in onset and painless. Rash was pink in color, slightly raised, round to irregular in shape, and it ranged from pea size to coin size. It was non fluoritic, it was not associated with any burning sensation, vesicular eruptions, or discharge. She does not remember if there was any change in, on exposure to sunlight. Now, this, sorry, uh, this rash, when did she develop? One month back, but, but so prior now. to this presentation. So, what happened in between? So, she was not compliant to treatment, she only oh, had bleeding edema. Almost. Eight nine years she was not taking anything. She was taking steroids on and off, and kept on having fetal edema. But then she did not uh, go back to her methods. So one month back she started having rash. rash. Okay. Go ahead. For the uh, this complaint, she was taken to an, uh, a nearby hospital and was treated with medications, which uh, the brother remembers to be IV steroids, and the rash reduced over the next ten to fifteen days. She was also, her um, um, uh, steroid dose was also increased to 40 mg at this time. However, she noticed that there was swelling in um, both lower limbs, which used, uh, which initially used to occur on, on and off, now started increasing and gradually worsened to involved up to the thighs. She uh, also gradually noticed that there was tightness of her abdomen. Over the next 10 days, she also noticed reduced urine output, which was uh, both decrease in quantity and frequency of urination. She also developed shortness of breath over the last five days, which aggravated on exertion. Even up, uh, walking up to the washroom made her breathless. She, uh, this breathlessness was relieved on rest, and she denies any history of orthopnea or symptoms suggestive of PNP. 
She does not give any history of alloyed discoloration of eyes, no history of blood and urine, does not give any history of fever, no history of joint pains, no history of bluish discoloration of fingers, no history of alopecia. Alright, so she presented with rash, swelling lower limbs, decrease in urine output and shortness of breath. Okay. Past history, she does not have any history of. Uh, no, here, no. Repeatedly, you said investigation done this time. She presented to us with these symptoms. Okay. Uh, no, uh, no past history of tuberculosis, asthma, diabetes, or hypertension. No past history of joint pains or rash. Uh, on per, uh, coming to her personal history, she consumes a mixed diet. Bubble habits were regular. Bladder, she had decreased urine output since the last 10 to 15 days. Her sleep and appetite were reduced. No history of intake of alcohol or tobacco in any form. Menstrual history uh, 10 to 12 years ago, she had menorrhagia. However, since the last 7 to 8 years, she has been anonoric. Uh, she is anonoric. Uh, family history, her uh, mother is a diabetic since 4 years and father was a long-standing hypertensive and developed a kidney disease one month prior to his death at 75 years of age, details of which are not known. She has one brother and there is no history of similar illness in the family. She present, uh, goes to the hospital, she presented to us with these symptoms. Uh, on uh, presentation, she was uh, found to be in, uh, she had decreased urine output and uh, was tachypneic and was started on diuretic infusion. She did not uh, respond to diuretics and uh, require in view you of... You can give first the basic investigation what you had. You would have started treatment <coughs> after that. So her um, investigations at admission, uh, hemoglobin was 6.7, uh, uh, total leukocyte count of uh, 4,850 and platelet count of 1,61,000. Uh, her kidney function test uh, uh, showed urea of 132, creatinine of 3.2, uh, sodium of 130 and potassium of 4.8. Her albumin at admission was 1.56 and bicarbonate of 14. Uh, total bilirubin was 0.8 and direct bilirubin 0.68 and uh, SGOT, HGPQ was 64 and 14. Great thing. Yes. Serum clear. 3.2. Okay. You have given everything but you have not told us urine. Sir. That is the unfortunate thing. This is what is happening. You forget to see the urine. What was the urine finding? Uh, sir, her urine examination and admission. Uh, sir, I have not examined the urine because I examined the patient on day 3 of admission. At that time, she was anuric. However, the first day, uh, urine examination was sent from the ward. We don't have the urine. Urine examination findings of uh, protein uh, 4 plus RBC 70 per high power feed, uh, pus cells 84 per high power feed, uh, no cast. What is active urinary tract? How you can say no cast? I am not agree with you. You said 70 to 80. Uh, 70. Uh, Professor Gupta has raised a point. How do you see urine? That's, so uh, that's a simple thing. If you don't know, if you have not seen any time, how do you examine you? Uh, sir, when we take a microscopy, uh, we uh, have to uh, start the examination within 4 hours of the collection. Uh, we will, you uh, can we examine can... up to 24 hours, keep it, yes, yeah. if... keep it in the fridge. Keep it in the fridge, you can it. examine later on. <laughs> uh, we'll within 4 hours, if we have maintained at the temperature, then we can uh, examine later on. Uh, we have to uh, put it in a uh, test tube and uh, keep it in a centrifuge and keep a balanced uh, test tube for at the cent uh, centrifuge and uh, centrifuge it at uh, 1500 rpm for uh, 3 to 5 minutes and then uh, discard the supermutant and examine the sediment uh, on uh, low power and then high power. What do you, where do you see the cast? Professor so Gupta asked you about the cast. Where do you see the cast? What you should know, she has told correctly. Whatever urine you take, 5 to 10 ml, centrifuge it for at 1500 revolutions per minute. If you can sediment it at higher pace also, but if you are doing at higher speed, the cast may fragment. So 
here she is preserving the caste. She has done that. After that, after three to five minutes, you will have just a pallet of sediment. So you throw the supernet, just the pallet of sediment, small amount. With a pipette, you can pick it, put it on a slide, make a smear and examine. If you have to look at the cast, you have to look at the edges. The cast will come at the edges. And possibly you will have to do the illumination, the lower focus has to come, the diaphragm has to come close to the slide. So then you can appreciate the cast. Because he rightly said, if you are seeing RBC 60 to 70, and then you say no casts are seen, possibly somebody has not looked at the periphery, one has not given it due concentration to that. Now with this sediment, what you are saying, Yurin, what is your impression? Patient has presented with typical rash, you said. Because this patient had already a diagnosis of lupus. 14 years back. What is the characteristic rash of lupus? You can tell us. The patient has a mellow rash, sparing the angle of mouth. Sparing the? What is the meaning of lupus actually? Wolf. All right. So it is involving the bridge of the nose and going up to the cheeks, like you say typical butterfly. But when you say disquiet lupus, that rash can involve the ears and any other part also, scalp, other areas also. So this lady had typical, you say, maculopapular rash, you said. <coughs> no, was it disquiet? It involved the face, the back, and the upper limbs, and she does not remember whether it involved the head or the shoulder or not. And it was slightly. And the difference between disquiet and the malar rash? Because when it will heal, disquiet is a deeper. So it can leave scar or mark. Whereas typical malar rash does not heal. Alright. So she had malar rash. Now, you have seen the urine sediment, what is called the active sediment? The presence of RBCs or uh, presence of RBC or WBC caste is not mandatory. Oh. How many are RBCs, how many WBCs? More than five RBCs. Oh, more than five RBCs, WBCs and presence of protein is making it active sediment. So this lady had active sediment. What is telescopic urine? Telescopic urine. What is it telescope? What is telescope? A lot of uh, cells in It will contain stuff. all the elements. You will contain protein, RBCs, WBCs, cast, WBC cast, RBC cast. The way the telescope, huh? Yeah. yeah. Who invented telescope? When you see with the telescope, you see everything. You see magnified area. And that is the time as Dr. Gupta is mentioning that you are seeing WBC, RBC, protein, fragments, everything you are seeing. That is a telescope. So what was your clinical impression with this active urinary sediment? Creatinine 3.2. Hemoglobin is pretty low, 6.7. Actually, lupus nephritis uh, probably a flare in, uh, at, this, at this point. Uh, with uh, probably class uh, 3 or 4 lupus nephritis. You will prefer 3 or 4? Four? 4 or 2. Because you said she became anuric. 4 first. Like so four. don't bring 3 here. Because she became anuric, that means it was a diffuse involvement. That is how she is becoming anuric. So what was platelets? Platelet was 116. What are the types of lupus? You can look at us. 
If somebody is asked what are the types of lupus nephritis, no, not nephritis, lupus, because you only said wolf. All right. No, uh, this, this is a basic question, not uh, specific for nephrologist. You always say either it is a simple lupus which is not involved in the kidney, so it's an extra renal lupus, right? Other, it can be a lupus nephritis classical. The four types you generally say. Third type you say, person has got neonatal lupus. And fourth you say, if a person has got drug induced lupus. So that goes as per etiology. Now, you are looking down. What is neonatal lupus? She can answer. Well, from Mother to child. Uh, you can stand up and tell, tell everybody. Mother to child. How? The, every mother has got, if the mother is bringing, uh, producing a child, will it get transmitted? Not every mother. Anyone? <laughs> anti Rho and anti lock. Antibodies. Are they present in lupus? What percentage of lupus patients have got anti rho or anti la? Rough guess. 30 percent. Whereas in scleroderma, it is 60 to 90 percent. But in lupus, it is around 30 percent. So, a lady has to have that. And then she has to, because these will cross the placenta and come to the child. How do the neonatus lupus present? Plus, Dr. Sam asked a question to you, what this was? Yes. Fine. So that is the problem. And majority of the time, this complete heart block may require therapeutic treatment. So that is one. Then you said second drug induced. You can answer that. Which drugs can produce drug induced lupus? Sulfur drugs can produce. Say again? Sulfur drugs. Sulfur. Hydralazine can cause. Hydralazine one. Isoniazine. Isoniazine. Go ahead. Propyl thyroxine. Hmm? Propyl thyroxine. I'm not sure about Propyl thyroxine. Propyl thyroxine. Propyl thyroxine. Propyl thyroxine. Quinidine. Any antibiotic? Any antibiotic? Even INH. All right. So, what is the peculiarity of how do you identify this drug induced lupus? By test? Antihistone antibodies. So, that is when you are suspecting a drug, then you think of antihistone antibodies. They are positive. So, she has killed. Neonatal lupus, <coughs> drug induced, and you know, extra renal manifestation. There are many people. What percentage of lupus patients will develop lupus nephritis? Yeah, maybe, yeah, 50, 60 percent will develop. Rest may be having just an extra renal. Now, what do you do now in this patient? It's your said class 4, right? Is it cystrentic transformation or it is simple class 4? It can be simple class 4 or cystrentic transformation. Because of the rapidity with which it is developing, it is probably having cystrentic. You have told only class, first you have mentioned class 3, right? And you said no, it can be class 4. Then class 4 with cystrentic transformation, the patient will be in anemia. Only class 4 DPGN is unlikely to the patient to be having anemia. Okay, so what happened? Well, how did you manage? Uh, so this patient did not respond to initially to diuretics and hence required dialysis in view of anemia. Uh, so after two sessions of dialysis, this patient underwent uh, needle kidney biopsy. After two sessions of dialysis, is there a benefit of giving dialysis? So this patient required uh, dialysis because she was in volume overload. Okay, and that given way, yes. Uh, she was unable to lie down flat also, so she required okay. dialysis prior to uh, 
the Parapsi was uh, uneventful and uh, uh, then she, uh, after uh, doing Parapsi we had given her uh, Ali Mithail prednisolone pulse. After just doing the biopsy, you gave methyl prednisolone pulse, okay? Sorry. So what, what were the biopsy findings? Uh, so the kidney biopsy uh, uh, on light microscopy revealed 8 glomeruli uh, with uh, 2 cellular crescents, a diffuse mesangial expansion with increased mesangial cellularity, uh, focal endocapillary proliferation, uh, non-uniform thickening of capillary loops, few glomeruli showing viral lesions, no glomerulosclerosis, the tubular interstitial compartment revealed uh, patchy uh, mild lymphomononuclear interstitial inflammation, no interstitial fibrosis or tubular atrophy. Now, you, I think uh, you can stand up. What is the activity score what she has mentioned? Just you can repeat the light microscopy. Uh, two cellular crescents. Uh, diffuse uh, mesangial expansion with increased mesangial cellularity, uh, focal endocapillary proliferation, uh, few glomeruli showing wire loop lesions, uh, no glomerulosclerosis, tubular interstitial compartment showing patchy mild lymphomononuclear interstitial, interstitial inflammation. Yes. So, for crescents, we give a score of 6 uh, uh, for endocapillary proliferation, we give a score of 3. For viral location, a score of 3. Uh, for interstitial inflammation, a score of 10. So depending so, on the... Fine. So, maybe we got... Please sit down. Maybe. Uh, so, what you are saying is, the chronicity index is not there. Though she has said, what, how much was the IFTA? So there was no IFTA. No IFTA. There is no tubular atrophy, she has said. No scarring, she has said. No fibrous crescent, she has said. So chronicity is not there. The disease is active. As, as was expected, that all the eight glomeruli are getting involved. The lesions are scattered. Some mesangial is involved. There is an endocapillary proliferation. There is endocapillary infiltration. And then you are having wire loops. What else? Endocapillary proliferation, essential hypercellularity, two cellular crescents, and uh, viral lesions, and interstitial inflammation. Okay. So, with this scenario, how do you want to manage the patient? She is a 53, 54 year old lady. You should know that lupus. Though, of course, she does not qualify for elderly lupus. <coughs> what is elderly lupus? Anybody, if a person is developing lupus after the age of 50 years, that is a, the lupus in elderly. And elderly lupus generally does not involve much of kidneys. They will have skin manifestation, rash, everything. But kidney and hematology will be spared. But this is not classifying because her disease started at the age of 38, 39. Right? So now what treatment do you want to give? Because you are all very well read for treatment protocols. Uh, you want to give her uh, MMF? You want to give her cyclophosphamide? What? Steroid plus cyclophosphamide is treatment. Why? Uh, sir, uh, PGM like presentation with the crescents, uh, we would prefer cyclophosphamide first and steroid uh, IV methyl prednisolone uh, 500 mg uh, for th 3 days. You will follow with trial. Uh, so, uh, you will look for NIH. It's a severe lupus. NIH. You want NIH uh, in for trial repeat. involved. Uh, I think the last one. Lupus. Last, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. You can stand up and just for repetition, what is NIH trial for cyclophosphamide? What is the recommended dose? Second year? Or second year, but you are supposed to know NIH. There is no excuse. Here, sorry, I don't know the names. Yeah, you can tell. What is the recommended NIH protocol for cyclophosphamide? 
Yes. Uh, the 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 so to, every quarterly for one and a half year. So six cycles, every quarterly for one and a half year, six more, then, then six monthly for one year. So total 14 odd grams you are requiring. And the incidence of amenorrhea? Anyone, I think. It's very high. See, keep in mind, amenorrhea is not only the dose, it is at what age you are giving. She is giving if at the age of 53. Now, at age of 53, there is no reserve. She is already menopausal. It is not making a difference. But even if, let's say, she was 40, she does not have reserve. So, incidence of amenorrhea is pretty high, 50%, 60%. Same if a girl is taking, 20-year girl, she has got ovarian reserve. The incidence is much less, maybe 5%, 10%. So, the incidence of amenorrhea <coughs> is dependent on age of the... Besides the duration and the amount of cyclophosphamide, it is also on age. Keep in mind... It is worse in young people, in males, because males' spermatogenesis is a very, very active process. Mitosis, meiosis is occurring very fast. So, males are more affected than females. Therefore, when you are giving cyclophosphamide to males, male pupils is different. Possibly, you tell them to preserve your sperms. So, sperm preservation is done, so that at a later stage, you can have artificial in insemination and children. So that is precaution. In females, younger ones, you don't bother too much. But in older ones, you have to bother. So then you said, you want to give uro lupus. You can, somebody can, you can tell, what is uro lupus? So, uh, we give 500 milligrams of uh, cyclophosphamide every two weekly for uh, six doses. Every 15 days for six doses, total three grams. So, whereas here it is going to so many grams. But here's the population in which it first given. Eurolupus was involved mainly the only the Caucasian population and they did not involve severe lupus. The serum creatine was just 1.3 and protein urea was 3.5 to 4.5 grams. So, your patient is RPG and presentation in which you can't fit your Eurolupus. Now, other thing, Eurolupus. Uh, keep in mind from India, we have got study from Dr. Manish Rati from PGI Chandigarh. There is another study from California also. So first, Eurolupus, same regimen. Caucasians, Europeans have got milder disease. Who have got severe disease? African Americans, Hispanics, Asians. We have got severe disease. So this Eurolupus trial was done in California. It was as good as cyclophosphamide. It was done in India. It is also as good as that. But mind you, as Professor Gupta mentioned, serious cases were not included. They included mild to moderate cases. Crescentic was not included. So possibly this case we don't know. We don't know. So the choice becomes yours. How you want to manage. How did you manage? What was the dose reduction? 25% dose reduction. This patient received 500 mg of cyclophosphamide per day. So you gave it the uh, NIH regime or Eurolupus regime? Yes, Eurolupus. Well, the time is not there. You said she came only one month back. So you, we gave because such acute problem, first you have to give three days of methyl bread. So you gave three days of methyl bread and then you gave cyclophosphamide. So far you might have given two pulses. One. 
only one pulse. And how is she at the moment? She was discharged in a uh, dialysis dependent state. Because it is going to take time. It is not a rapid process. You will ca carry on, keep giving it. And it is quite possible. What is the response rate? The question will be that the patient is going to ask you, Dr. Sam, what will happen? Class 4 lupus, only 40% will go to ESRD. Up to 40% can go to ESRD. The response rate is quite good. So the response, if you take in the long run, response is almost 70 to 80 percent these days. When you combine complete remission and partial remission together, the response is, because the question can be, what is complete remission? You can tell us. When do you say, this lady, when will you say she has got complete remission? You can stand up and tell, so that everyone should listen. We don't want to make you stand, but let everybody listen. There is, uh, to start with, there is no standard criteria, what is a complete remission, but whatever is mentioned by K. Doki. How? No means what? Less than 500. Yeah, sit down, please sit down. So one, she is saying that protein urea should become less than 500 milligram. She said protein is 4 plus. So it should become less than 500 milligram. One. Second. Uh, renal, uh, uh, renal recovery or uh, uh, to baseline or up to 10 to 15 percent of the baseline. So that means if the basal creatinine was 1.5, she has come with whatever 3 point something it should become 15 to 25 percent of baseline. That means it should become less than 2 milligram. Then you will say that, that the sediment should become bland. Whatever active sediment you are saying, more than 5 RBC, more than 5 WBC, it should become bland. Then you will say, and partial remission? Partial remission is 50 percent reduction in protein urea and less than 3 gram of protein urea. If it is nephrotic, it becomes less than 3 grams. And then again, the renal recovery to baseline or up to 10 to 15 percent of baseline uh, by 6 to 12 months of initiation. So, we at the moment, we don't know how much she will recover. But going with the premise that there is no chronicity, it is appears pretty good that if you are giving this regimen, people should respond to that. And it might take, I think, minimum, I think two to three months before you start showing the response. Yes, you have said this will land up in two years. What is the natural history of new personal fighters? Untreated. You tell me. What is a... Overall, if we consider all classes, up to 10 percent only reach uh, ESRD. Uh, but if we specifically, it, it, it will depend upon the type of type. class. Right? Your next answer. If it is uh, class four, then up to 44 percent uh, will reach ESRD. You say the proliferative donor nephritis will reach ESRD in 20 to 30 percent of cases. One is your renal outcome. Another is the patient outcome. This will be the natural history. Uh, what is the patient outcome? Uh, but patient will be infections only, no? That's only, no? Fifty percent of the eight is otherwise. By five years, the mortality is fifteen to twenty percent. So this, this, we should know the natural history of any disease. So which parameter is more important? Protein <coughs> or <laughs> So, any study you can tell me this much protein urea, the long term prognosis is good. The Eurolupus study showed that less than 0.8 gram per day protein urea has a better pro long term prognosis. So, the more important thing is protein urea. 
So you can, on the basis of proteinuria, you can say that this patient will have long-term prognosis good or not. Hematuria doesn't correlate with the prognosis. Even if you combine both the things, they will not correlate. So let us say now, your patient after two months or three months doesn't show any response. Let us say it is refractory or resistant lupus. Any option you will try. So, multi-target uh, multi therapy can be tried or newer drugs can be tried for in between you mentioned that she had remission initially and after that somebody started with tacrolimus. Is it correct, right or wrong? Yeah, ideally at that time patient should have been biopsied to see for any... Uh... No, keep in mind, if a person has responded to a particular disease, can we start the same yes. session? And if the person develops a relapse, he should be treated or she should be treated same, with the same, same regime. regime. She can be treated with the same regime because she has responded. We do not know whether the person, like you said, she's a non-compliant lady at that point of time, whether she was taking steroid or she was not taking MMF. We don't know. Because if she responded initially, she can be tried with the same. So what is the status of tecrolimus? Who should be given tecrolimus? You all discuss that you get a patient tomorrow of lupus. The options are MMF, oblique cyclophosphate. You said NIH and all other trials are showing cyclo was good. But once MMF came, there have been many trials you mentioned where the comparison, even your arms trial, Armstrong also tried that the induction therapy. They also found that IV cyclophosphamide versus MMF, they are equivalent as induction. But keep in mind, these studies did not take very severe cases. So people have tendency that maybe cyclophosphamide should be given to them. The only advantage of cyclophosphamide, what are the advantages of giving cyclophosphamide? Yeah. Say again. Not shorter duration. One is compliance. What she said, she is non compliant. That you are giving every 15 days injection. So compliance is better. Number two? More emissions. More. Relapse rate is lesser. It's not like that. Both are equal. See, the hands trial was bring into the picture to show the severity of MMF over cyclophosphamide. But it was not happened. And relax with, in some some subgroups, it was little bit superior. But the relapse rate, remission rate, they was almost comparable. You are talking about uh, the less side effect that will be with the IV cyclophosphamide versus oral cyclophosphamide. The toxicity will be less with the IV cyclophosphamide, but with relapse rate will be more with IV, IV cyclophosphamide as compared to the oral cyclophosphamide. Now, come to the question why she has stopped to the drugs? What should be the criteria to stop that drug? Uh, the definitive end point for stopping treatment is not defined, but all patients should receive combined induction and maintenance therapy of not less than 36 months. And, uh, if a patient has when been you can consider, when you can consider, when you can consider, consider if a uh, consider if a patient has no proteinuria or active sediments for more than twelve months, he can consider. And it is also recommended that a biopsy should be done prior to stopping therapy nowadays because the clinical uh, parameters and histological parameters do not always go. Most at of the time, do not. At eighteen months, if the patient is having complete remission, at 34 to 36 months, you can try you can to stop, stop the therapy. But if remission is not there at 18 months, you have like to continue one. the treatment in life. So here, there was some mistake, right? Now comes to the second point, when she was given tetrolimus. The, 
another mistake was there. Right. So you have mentioned uh, rituximab. So which is the trial with rituximab, and what was the result? Lunar trial showed that adding uh, rituximab to the standard of care did not improve outcomes as compared to standard of care alone. But in uh, so it is not used as first line therapy. But in cases which have res resistant or uh, frequent relapse, rituximab can be tried. Any indication of plasma paresis in your patient? In our patient has come with. <coughs> what are the indication of plasma paresis in SLE? Atlas positivity and, and fear, present of TMA. Cerebritis, severe skin manifestations. These are the indications where you should try plasma paresis in these. Patients. So, so yeah. yes, sir. no. As a second, you should also know in Indian scenario, which people will ask you about cyclophosphamide, is the cost. Cyclophosphamide therapy yes, total will cost you just around eight thousand rupees. Each cyclophosphamide wire is I know two fifty rupees or hundred fifty rupees. Okay. All all together, they... it will not cost you seven eight thousand rupees. With service, if you are giving MMF, it may be 50, 60,000 rupees. So, if you are talking about cost, people cannot afford. Cyclophosphamide has got advantage. One, you said it is cheaper. Second, compliance can be better. Otherwise, we have no choice. As we said, if it is refractory, so possibly you said there is rituximab. There are four trials of rituximab. And all the trials, except one on a small population, it showed a better result. Otherwise, for exam, it is not adding any advantage. As she said, to whatever standard therapy we are giving, if by combining, there is no added advantage. But in refractory case, if this patient doesn't respond, so in this, then the plasma or this have got some standard. Next, you are talking about multi-targeted therapy. I think we will take on one. What is that and uh, why it is not practiced universally? What was the outcome of that trial? The trial came in 2014-15, multi-targeted therapy, TNI plus MMF plus steroid. Only the patient has been already exposed to cyclophosphamide. Or does not tolerate standard dose of MMF, only then we consider uh, multi target therapy uh, with uh, CNI plus low dose MMF and steroid. Uh, the outcomes are comparable to uh, uh, NIH protocol but has frequent relapse. So there was no difference actually. Now the recent trial with Boclosporin, which has added, that, that shows us better uh, advantage of, in terms of uh, relapse. So, the question will be the examiner will ask you, why you want to do the biopsy in SLE? You can start the treatment. So, uh, first we need to know what uh, class of... Uh, so, you want lupus to diagnose. We want okay. to diagnose the class of uh, lupus and also proteinuria. There will be, this question will have three answers. To diagnose, to prognosticate, and to treat. This this question, because in SA you can, you start a So you will start, you have the class three or four, you have a protein urea, right? You uh, have active urine sediment, normal serum treatment, you have to start the steroid and MMR. But you have to be on your point, I will do the biopsy. Above which protein urea you will do the biopsy? In SLE, even about 500 milligrams, you will do Because when you get a reference and they will show it, do a biopsy on this protein urea, you should have in your mind that protein urea is more than 500 milligram. I will do that. How many people uh, transform to other classes? Up to uh, 30%. 30%. 
they can transform. And what are the normal transformation from which class to which class? Sir, from class 2 to uh, class 4, class 3, or class 5, also get transformed to class 4, class 3, um, and this can involve class 4 plus 5. All right, now you are going to treat this patient with uh, cyclophosphamide and steroids. You are going for two months, three months or something, isn't it? What is the life course of the disease once a person is on dialysis? This lady is already on dialysis, you said. This patient, she has come with an acute presentation. So we, need to, we, are, we will hope for a response after exam. In case patient goes into ESRD, uh, then the uh, disease will become quiescent. Uh, there will not, not be any flares once the patient reaches ESRD. Generally, the disease becomes dead once a person is in the advanced, chronicity is there. So, uh, if she says, I want to have a transplant, suppose you have tried the therapy, it has failed. Patient has gone on to dialysis or any other patient he is on dialysis. <coughs> you start the patient on dialysis, how fast you can do the transplant? It is better to do the transplant within three months uh, because uh, keeping a uh, patient on dialysis for more than three months in a cell was in each PSRD will uh, uh, send the uh, prognosis to full. It's okay. It's at, at, at any point. The over question is what is the waiting period? This patient is having SLV, one patient is having Anka associated vasculitis, one patient is having anti DPA. What should be the waiting period? At least for SLV. So there is, there will be why? The disease, overall disease has become Because there is no clear cut guidelines in SLV. Even the auto antibodies can be positive at the time of transplant and you can go with transplant in SL. What about Anka? As per KDU guidelines, what is the waiting? Only six months. One year. One year. And what is anti -DPM? Disease should be silent for anti Six months. Six months. Six months for anti -DPM. One year. Anka, one year. In some, where they have written six months, not in anti uh, KDB. In up to date, they have written six months, right? And for SL, you can because the meta analysis doesn't show any correlation with autoantibodies and disease recurrence. What is the recurrence rate post transplant? 11 to 20 percent. No, it's very high. Your time, it's just 2 to 11. Pretty low. Pretty low. 11 to 20 percent, you're telling very high. When do you want to give tetralimus to this? Any person. If the patient has already been exposed to uh, cyclophosphamide and is not uh, tolerating standard doses of amyloid. So logic, that means uh, it should be clear in your mind that the first two drugs always should remain cyclophosphamide and MMM. Tetralimus or cyclosporin should not be your priority drugs. It should come as second line or third line drug. It is only, I mean, a lady is pregnant or something. You can't try MMF to the person. Possibly, you can treat a person with tetralimus. But whatever reasons, a person is not able to tolerate MMF, you can start with tetralimus. So tetralimus should always remain number two drug. And as she mentioned, multi-targeted therapy response rates are almost equal. But there is no point of treating a person with multiple drugs if the response rate is not better. So it is always good to stick to two drugs rather than go to three drugs. Somebody will say make four drugs, it will be still better. So stick to drugs where the response is better. Last question. How you will see the ANA? Which is the best method? So the best for sensitivity is in the person, but the Which person in the person. How you will do? Have you done your cell? Not done it, but in human epithelial cells, uh, there are multiple auto antigens already present. So we will uh, 
grow these cells and uh, put the patient's uh, thera in dilution onto this. And then a second antibody, which is fluorescein stain, will be put onto this after washing the first time and it will be uh, incubated. And then this will be seen uh, under. Uh, so, the what are the patterns? So, the second will be homogeneous pattern, spectral uh, pattern, centromere pattern, and nucleolar yes. pattern. It is specific for SLE. There is nothing specific for SLE, but SLE can have homogeneous spectral or nuclear pattern. So if it is diffuse and pericular pattern, more in favor of SLE. If it is speckled, SLE versus Leopards. And what is the dilution? One is to 80. Minimum of 1 is to 80. 1 is to 160. So somebody is having ANA positive. You have spores I or you have ANA positive. How much chances I have to develop the SL? 5%. Yeah, ANA positivity. Now, lupus patient, what percentage will have ANA positivity? Lupus patients? I mean, you have got a pure proven lupus patient. Uh, out of 100, how many are expected to be ANA positive? 80 to 90%. 95%. 95% will be ANA positive. How many will be DSDNA positive? 70%. 70-80%. Which is the best method to do DNA? DSDNA. One is ELISA. Other? Can you say? Right? That is even better. And uh, there is another nucleosome method where the DNA is on nucleosome. Because basically, you are treating patient serum, which is having antibodies to DSDNA. And what is the antigen? Sometimes you take, have, have two cell line. Now, what is the amount of DNA is that? Then people started taking sometimes 3 d which is a protozoa. Now, that is 98% DNA. So, if you start with that, the so possibly positivity rate will be higher. But the best method you said is possibly a nucleosome, and if you are doing a cami reduce that is even better. The predictability is even better. Now, when do you suspect a person is having relapse? I think we are covering most of the aspects of lupus. You can start asking questions. Are any doubt in your mind? When do you see the person is having relapse? Logically, a person has already had a remission. And then there is an increase in protein urea or sediment becomes active. Do you have any doubt? You want to ask some? Any question from yours? Exam going. So you are clear how you are going to treat a case of lupus? Your priorities? And when you... Okay. Actually, we want to say, you know, it's not continuity. Right? You have to tell the chief complaints, then continue with your course in hospital. Then come to pass as three families. Three. You got my point? So, there is a break in continuity. When there is a break in continuity, so, so you will, the examiner not, will, will be able to register. Because you will have only, it will be a long case, you will have only 40 minutes total, in total. So this is what you are saying is a little, first of all I compliment you, you prepared well and uh, you knew the answers to most of the questions. Little unusual case, the usual presentation of lupus is in younger patients. Here the onset was close to 40 years and then you are, whatever medicine she was taking, for 8-9 years, with little bit of steroids, she remained quiet. It is interesting that 
there was no features of chronicity which have gone. This is only proving that this is a disease of relapses and remissions. For good 10 years, no permanent changes have come, despite she is non-compliant. And then suddenly you find that she develops relapse. What precipitated relapse, we don't know. Because you should also know that the lupus, there is genetic predisposition, there is a racial predisposition, there is an environmental predisposition. So that is why you say African Americans, whether it's a Paul 1 gene, that they are more, the disease is more severe. And it is also known that MMF is superior in those subset of patients where uh, Hispanics or African Americans better. So MMF possibly today is scoring better. By trials, we cannot say this is superior, but overall, if you analyze, it is taking an upper hand and should become logically the drug of choice, whether it is induction and maintenance you did not mention. A word about maintenance also. Now, person, let's presume this lady goes into remission. And if she goes into remission, protein urea decreases, everything settles down. What do you want to give for maintenance? You didn't mention. MMF, but MMF is the better drug for maintenance. So as a thyroprin has also been tried, but Alan's trial showed that MMF was superior to uh, as a Which trial showed? Alan's trial. Maintenance. Alan's maintenance. 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 And maintained trial was also done which compared uh, the hyperin and MMF. But in that trial, uh, it was uh, MMF Yeah, so they were, they were both equal, equal in that. But as a hyperin had uh, most uh, side effects in the form of side effects. But keep in mind, AMS trial was a small trial. When they were doing the uh, maintenance therapy, they were hardly hurting 100 patients or 80 patients. And there was a small <coughs> population. Whereas maintenance trial had higher number of population. So keep in mind that if you want to continue, if the patient is tolerating MMF, you can continue MMF. But if a person is not tolerating, ESA is not a bad drug to maintain. So lupus is a very variable uh, disease. You have to continue medication for around two and a half to three years. And only if you find as Professor Gupta mentioned that if you find after 18 months, patient has already gone into remission, patient is stable. So that will give you a hint that possibly we can try to stop the drug after three months. And keep in mind that hydroxychloroquine possibly reduces relapses. So therefore, all these patients, hydroxychloroquine can be continued. Because that is good for extra renal manifestation also and to check relapse also. A cheap drug, hydroxychloroquine, you can continue for that. I think if there are no other questions, we can stop. If there is any question, we are available. Thank you. That's your Fine. Thank you.